You're listening to the Informal Bible Study, a casual and applicational look at the scriptures. I'm John Stonge, and it's great to have you with us today. In just a few moments, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 down to verse 12, and we're going to be asking the question, who have I been built to be? But before we take a look at that question, just a couple quick things I wanted to share with you. First of all, just this past week, I released Volume 8 in the Desire Jesus series. It's available for purchase on Amazon, or if you'd like it for free, which I think free is a great price, (laughs) uh, stop by our website, desirejesus.com. You'll see a link for uh, Volume 8. The link is right there on the front page of the website. You'll be able to download it for free in PDF form, and uh, by all means, we hope that you read it and enjoy it and use it. I was pleased this week. My youngest child, my daughter Julia, was telling me that she reads uh, the Desire Jesus series at school every morning. They have quiet time, a, uh, a time where they're able to read, and uh, the, they have iPads that are school iPads that they use for different things in class. And she said, yeah, I downloaded it to my iPad so that I could read it every day for our quiet reading time. So she said she spends a few minutes every morning reading that at school. I was encouraged to, to hear that. And in fact, that was one of the reasons why I actually started writing the Desire Jesus devotionals. We do have a Facebook page for that as well. You could just search for Desire Jesus on Facebook if you want to follow that in your Facebook feed. But again, the 30-day devotional, Desire Jesus, Volume 8, it's available for free right now at our website, desirejesus.com. So by all means, stop by, grab a free copy. We'll have it up there for a few weeks, and we're already preparing Volume 9 for release as well. So that'll be along sometime next month. Now, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, today we're asking the question, who have I been built to be. And we're looking at the first section of 1 Peter chapter 2. So let me read that for us. We're in 1 Peter chapter 2 today, starting with verse 1, and this is what it states. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the privilege to be able to read it and study it together today. And we pray, Lord, that as we look at this portion of Scripture, that you'd speak to our minds, and that you would speak to our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As a dad, it's been fascinating for me to watch my children grow up. We actually have conversations about this with them frequently, and I think that they find some of those conversations interesting because they notice that the older they get, the more freedoms we give them and the more we trust them. I think I probably annoy them a little because I tend to take a lot of pictures along the way, but I have to say it amazes me to watch how quickly they have changed and how drastically different they seem 
when I look at pictures or videos that I know I just took just a few short years ago, I, I see them growing bigger and stronger and more mature, and it fascinates me. Now, regardless of our age, every one of us is a work in progress. As God's children, there are things that the Lord has already done for us, as well as things that He continues to do for us. He is building us and strengthening us. He is facilitating maturity in our lives. And what do you suppose He wants His finished product to look like? Who is the Lord building us to be? Well, a few of those things are referenced in the portion of Scripture that I read just a moment ago, so let's take them a section at a time. But when you look at the first few verses of 1 Peter chapter 2, one of the things that it indicates that the Lord is building us to be is a person who craves spiritual nourishment, one who craves spiritual nourishment. Look again at verses 1 to 3. It says this, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Let's pause there for just a moment. So, as we saw when we were looking at the previous chapter of this book, the Lord desires that we have an active faith. He wants us to move in a direction that is the complete opposite of the direction we were headed in when we lived in ignorance. So instead of going back to what he has redeemed us from, he has called us and he has empowered us to make forward progress as new people who desire to reflect his heart and his image. Back in the day before we knew Jesus, there were certain practices that we welcomed into our lives that we considered appropriate. When we had conflict with others, we were malicious sometimes toward them. When we wanted to obtain something the easy way, we employed deceit on occasion. We coveted things that didn't belong to us, and we didn't hesitate to tear others down with our words when it suited our objectives. But that's not the kind of life a follower of Christ is called to live. We're called to put that kind of activity away, meaning we're supposed to be tossing it in the garbage or the junk drawer of our lives so it gets lost and forgotten because we've been made a brand new person. Scripture tells us we've experienced a new birth in Christ, and our walk with Him begins with a form of spiritual infancy. Now, generally speaking, what do infants want? They tend to want several things. They, they tend to want rest, they tend to want comfort, and they tend to want food. And if any of those things are missing, they usually make a point to scream until the situation gets rectified. And when it comes to eating, once they discover that they enjoy food, they tend to crave it more and more and more. My good friend Dylan, who is the youth pastor at my church, uh, he and his wife are weeks away from having their first baby. So they're about to experience the process of raising an infant for the first time. And he and I were talking about that. He and I actually had the privilege of grabbing lunch recently. And uh, when I suggested where we should grab lunch, I suggested a style of food to him that he had never tried before. We actually ate at a Thai restaurant. I don't know if you enjoy Thai food or if you've ever had it, uh, but it's very delicious. And there's a really good Thai restaurant that's not that expensive right by where we live. So we ate there, and when we sat down to eat, he looked at the menu, and because all of this was new to him, he wasn't sure what to order, so he just ordered what I ordered, and now that he's tried it, he's going to want to have it again. He loved it, and he was saying to me just how much he enjoyed it, so now he craves it. He tasted it, saw how delicious it was, and now he wants it again, and my suspicion is that it will probably make the regular rotation of restaurants that he visits just like it has for me because I enjoy it so much. Well, our relationship with Christ operates in a similar way. Once we taste the goodness of his grace, the depth of his love, and the comfort our souls find in him, we tend to crave those things more and more. We want to be nourished by what only he can supply. And as we welcome the various forms of spiritual nourishment he offers, we grow more mature in our faith. 
as he pours into our lives from his word, as he pours into our lives from fellowship with other believers, as he pours into our lives through prayer and with his peace that is beyond human understanding, we are built up and made strong in Christ. What else does this scripture tell us that the Lord is creating us to be? Well, we're also told here that he has made us a priest in Christ's service. Look at verses 4 and 5. It says this, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, there's some language in this passage that admittedly is different from how we typically speak. So in this passage, Peter is making reference to some things that were spoken of in Psalm 118. And as he interprets that passage, he speaks of Jesus being rejected by men. But yet he is the cornerstone of the church. The church is being built by Christ and is held together by Christ. Christ isn't a dormant cornerstone. He is a living stone, and he is actively building up his family. As living stones who are being built up by Christ, we're described as a spiritual house that he's intentionally constructing. And not only are we stones that are being used to construct God's house, but we're also priests who serve within it. In Christ, that's true of all of us who believe in him. We've been made into a holy priesthood. During the Old Testament era, priests were instructed to offer sacrifices of certain animals in very specific ways. They were also given the privilege of drawing near to the Lord in a unique and privileged way. Now, through Christ, that privilege is also ours, but it operates on a deeper level. We're invited to draw near to the Lord every day of our lives, And we have the privilege of offering every aspect of ourselves as a living sacrifice to him. Our time, talents, treasures, plans, goals, and dreams are all things we give to him with gratefulness for his presence with us. Do you consider yourself a priest that has been made holy by Christ? Do you realize the privilege that you've been blessed with to draw near to God knowing that he joyfully welcomes you into his presence because you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. As a dad, I love my kids, and I insist that no matter how old they get, they get a hug before they go to bed. I have two children that give quick hugs and two that give long hugs. One actually hugs me for far too long, (laughs) to the point that it makes me a little claustrophobic, and I sometimes have to say, okay, That's enough for now. (laughs) But isn't it amazing to realize that God delights to have us enter into his proximity, and he doesn't tire of us drawing near to him, and he doesn't tire of us holding on to him. This is our privilege as priests who are welcomed into his presence. Now again, what else does this scripture tell us we're being built up to be? Well, when you look at verses 9 and 10, it tells us we're being built up to be one who belongs to God says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Not too far from our refrigerator is a drawer that has markers in it, and those markers get used regularly whenever someone in our home brings an iced coffee or other drink back home but doesn't immediately finish it because there's a lot of people living in our house, so we've developed the habit of writing our name on cups or other unfinished items before they go into the fridge. When we do that, we're being a little bit possessive, admittedly, of what we put in there because (laughs) I think we all have this uh, subtle fear that someone else is going to finish that beverage for us. But what we're doing is we're establishing ownership. We're establishing a sense of belonging with whatever item that happens to be, as our name is then stamped on the very thing that we plan to keep. Well, it's interesting when you think about things like that on a spiritual level, because through faith in Jesus Christ, 
we've been marked with his name. Look at what it tells us in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. It says it this way, The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. This isn't a casual decision on God's part. The scripture tells us we have been chosen by him to be a people for his own possession. He called us out of the darkness we were living in and welcomed us into his marvelous light. He removed the wrath we were deserving of and living under and bestowed his mercy on us instead. One of our greatest desires as people is a sense of belonging, and we find that in Christ. Through Jesus, we have been made into a united family of God's people, and he isn't ashamed to associate with us. He doesn't regret coming to get us. He isn't planning to get rid of us. Hebrews 2.11 says it this way, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. We belong to God. That's what his word tells us. We belong to him. Well, who else does this scripture tell us that we are? There's one more thing in the portion of scripture we read today, and it's this. We're sojourners in a confused world. Look again at verses 11 and 12. It says this, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Some people love to travel. That's sometimes true of me, but there are definitely some aspects of traveling that I find challenging and awkward. I have visited places where I didn't know the language. I have visited places that had a much lower standard of hygiene from what I'm used to. Uh, I visited places that ate and enjoyed foods that were completely unappealing to me. Visiting unfamiliar places can certainly be uncomfortable. Yet that is how our brief life on this planet is described in these verses. We're spoken of as sojourners and exiles in this world. Now, this makes sense since Scripture tells us we are citizens of a greater, eternal kingdom. Like it says in Philippians 3.20, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what God's Word tells us, and in a very real way, the mindset and practices of this world that are in opposition to the heart of Christ, are things we should abstain from. Worldly passions wage war against us. They conflict with Christ's will for us. They seek to tear us down even after Christ has built us up. This world is confused. People don't know who they are anymore. They don't understand and they don't accept who Christ is calling them to be. This world is filled with people trying as best as they can to carve out some sense of identity, but the identity they're trying to adopt directly conflicts with who God has called us to be. This world embraces ignorance, but Christ offers us true understanding. He helps us understand His plan for this world and likewise His divine plan for our lives. This world needs to see an example in God's people of what it's like to be at peace with God's perfect will. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you can be confident that he is building you to be someone who knows him, loves him, and reflects his heart. He wants to nourish you, keep you close to himself, assure you that you belong to him, and he wants to work in your life even though there are many forces at work in this world that are seeking to tear you down. In the midst of this all, it's quite helpful to know who he is building us up to be and what kind of outcome he seeks to produce from our faith. The world we live in may be confused, but we don't need to be because in Christ we find clarity. In Christ we learn who 
we've been built to be. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege to look at your word together today. Lord, we're grateful for your goodness. We're grateful for your love. We're grateful for your presence with us today. And Lord, we're thankful for the fact that you willingly and actively build us up. Lord, we are grateful for the privilege to trust in your son, Jesus Christ. And we're grateful for the fact that we're being built in so many ways, but ultimately your desire is that we reflect the heart of Jesus in every aspect of our lives. So Lord, we pray that by your grace that you would facilitate that. And we know, Lord, that your word assures us that that's exactly what you're doing. So we're grateful for that. And we're thankful, Lord, for the kind of plans that you have for us and that you continue to work them out day in and day out. We love you, Lord. We commit this day to your care, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for listening to the Informal Bible Study. As I mentioned at the start of this episode, I have a brand new devotional available for you to download at DesireJesus.com. It's the eighth volume in the Desire Jesus 30-Day Devotional Series. It's also available for purchase at Amazon if you want it in paperback or in Kindle edition. But if you want it for free, the PDF to download it is available right now at DesireJesus.com. But that's it for us today. Thanks again for listening. We hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week, and we look forward to getting together with you again right here next Monday. Take care.